اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ڈیئر پارٹیسپنٹس آئی ویلکم یو ٹو انادر سیشن آف مائی کورس گلوبلائزیشن اینڈ ڈیولپمنٹ ان دس لیکچر آئی شیل بریفلی ٹچ اپ آن ڈفرنٹ تھیریز آف گلوبلائزیشن ایز یو نو گلوبلائزیشن Uh, has become an overarching and uh, <clears throat> very significant concept not only in uh, sociological literature but in, but in other uh, disciplines and domains of inquiry. So, um, how can we look at globalization from a theoretical perspective? As I told you in my previous lectures that if we take up a uh, broader view of globalization Globalization is not a new phenomenon. When I say it's not a new phenomenon, I invite by, by uh, I mean that by, by virtue of uh, looking at the historical development of human societies and civilization, you will find out that people have been globalizing. People have been coming together. People have been interacting. Societies and civilizations have been interacting. So that is, I mean, the reason. I, I mean, uh, uh, emphasize that globalization is not a new phenomenon. It's been happening since the dawn of civilization for the last 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 years uh, BC. It's been happening. <coughs> different cultures in the ancient world, different cultures in the um, uh, classical world, medieval, uh, uh, before Christ, after the Christ. And, and, the, and the classical and the medieval ages and in the imperial ages people have been coming together and exchanging goods and ideas with each other. But anyway, I'll uh, come to my topic and I'll briefly touch upon two, three very important theories which will contextualize the question of globalization from a theoretical uh, uh, standpoint. And then, uh, well, we can say that imperialism can be a one very important theory to study the processes of globalization across the world. Then there can be another perspective uh, to look at globalization and that is uh, <coughs> colonialism. Phenomena which uh, unfolded during the 17th, 18th and 19th century across Asia and Africa. Then we can touch upon industrialism. When the modes of production um, in the backdrop of industrial revolution, how the um, uh, technology of production, productivity shifted from the land to machines and uh, the uh, 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 forces of production and means of production became highly mechanized, highly industrialized. So we can talk about industrialism. Uh, industrial um, uh, revolution as a form of globalization, as a theoretical perspective. And then we can um, um, look at globalization from the perspective of post-industrial and post-modern uh, perspective. How things have uh, shifted and um, moved and transformed in the wake of uh, internet, in the wake of uh, rapid uh, movement of uh, uh, information in the wake of uh, almost global prevalence and global um, uh, opening up of markets, free markets and in the wake of outsourcing and uh, <coughs> similarly uh, <coughs> shifting um, uh, production processes across the states and countries throughout the world not focusing on, on one country, not focusing on one uh, state, but being shared and shifted and transferred and exchanged across different boundaries, across the borders and across the nation states throughout the world. Now, when we look at the uh, imperialism, I mean, uh, roughly during the, uh, af just after the, uh, the age began, which we can uh, sufficient, I mean, <clears throat> if you historically look at the phenomena of imperialism, you can find imperial uh, Persia, you can find imperial Rome, you can find imperial India, imperial China, 
you won't find um, even imperial Egypt. I mean, imperial imperial mean the age when the when the countries were conquering other countries, when the source of economic sustain, sustainability and the source of political and economic power was mainly derived from conquest, one nation conquering the other nation, neighboring nation, adjoining nation, weaker or lesser uh, um, uh, powerful nation uh, all around them. So, the imperial age began very early with the establishment of human civilizations and human cultures across the world. But it was uh, particularly uh, the world imperialism has a particular association with the Roman Empire. The word Roman Imperium is you know is a very common commonly used in the literature and the Romans have been the perhaps the first people who established a mighty empire across Europe and into Asia Minor and uh, touching upon the uh, shores of Mediterranean and the northern Africa and into the heartland of Egypt and uh, the um, uh, Syrian up to up to the Persian borders. So, it was a huge empire, a mighty empire, you know, established by the Romans. Uh, mighty empires of the Romans. Then it expanded on, uh, it was, uh, it expanded on many <coughs> continents, on many <coughs> geographical regions from Europe to Asia Minor to I mean uh, Middle Eastern region to Northern Africa. It was huge, a big huge resource. And then we find the Egyptian Empire, we find the Indian Empires, we find the Persian Empire, the whole lot of during the ancient and then the classical period, post medieval period. But uh, particularly we can refer to the uh, in the say 14th, 15th and 16th century, we can identify particular uh, emergence of particular imperial powers across the world. In the, in the Asian continent in the east, we see a flowering of uh, Mughal uh, imperial empire, um, power and empire in India, in the, sub, in the big, in the subcontinent. Then we find the Chinese imperial uh, dynasty, and, and then if you if we move a little to the um, to the Middle East to the West Asia, we find the Persian Empire, imperial Persia, and then we find the imperial Ottomans, you know, almost uh, replacing and substituting the Roman Empire, almost uh, half of the Europe almost uh, the entire Asia Minor Central and regions up to Central Asia, Caucasia and to Arabia, certain parts of Arabia, North Africa, they were all part of the Roman Ottoman Empire. Similarly, we find uh, smaller imperial forces emerging in the Western European, I mean, the Spanish Empire you can say, in the aftermath of the uh, fall of the uh, Muslim rule in Spain, I mean in Andalus, this the Spanish empire, it imperial power increased and expanded manifold and they conquered the South American hemisphere and they moved into the northern parts of sub parts of Northern America. These of uh, Spanish empire then we find the um, French imperial and the Habsburg dynasty in Austria, we find then the rise of the British Empire in the uh, islands, uh, English islands and uh, the rise of the United Kingdom, Kingdom and it ultimately led to the colonialized colonization of the Asia and Africa. We, other find, we find other minor um, uh, imperial uh, states like Denmark, like Holland, like uh, uh, and, and in bigger empires like uh, France like uh, Spain, like uh, Germany in a, in a while, I mean they were able to uh, then count, um, expand there, you know. During the age, uh, age of uh, voyages and discovery when uh, first of all Columbus discovered the new world, 
the American continent followed by other you know uh, adventurers like Vasco da Gama from Portuguese who discovered India and then there was a whole wave of imperial west uh, continuously and consistently moving towards Asian and African greenlands, green pastures and they gradually through trade first and then through political uh, maneuvering were able to establish their imperial authority uh, particularly in subcontinent Go. with the rising uh, and uh, dynamic growth and expansion of the European uh, powers towards the Asian and African countries you know imperialism took a new form the eastern imperial states like uh, Mughals in India the Ottomans and the Pers Safavids in Persia and similarly the uh, um, uh, states in North Africa you know they came under a lot of pressure a lot of uh, challenge from the rising western West European and European powers and one after another they fell into their hands and as I as I referred earlier that first they came as traders the Europeans came as benevolent and uh, um, uh, honest traders and brokers and then they established their colonies gradually they established their colonies in these areas in these parts of the world and were successfully secondly, uh, uh, subsequently they were successful in taking advantage of the growing weaknesses political cultural economic weaknesses of uh, these uh, empires and were able to establish their uh, own imperial rule in <clears throat> Asia and Africa. One important imperial rise of imperial power was the British Empire. British were <clears throat> I would say fortunate enough to have uh, found India. I mean they succeeded in um, expelling French and the Portuguese and they were able to uh, establish their colonies and factories in um, the eastern parts of India and gradually in the 18th and the 19th century they expanded into the heartland of India, uh, Mughal India and subsequently in, they were able to um, take over completely the Indian subcontinent in 1857. But what happened subsequently that the uh, East India Company which was a trading company and became a political uh, uh, aspirant and political actor in the region was then uh, dismembered by the British crown and India was uh, merged into the United Kingdom it became part of the, uh, the so called jewel in the crown and the Queen Victoria declared herself to be the Empress of India and, and India was then started being uh, started govern with the, in the, Europe, uh, the Britishers you know they started governing in India from London. There was a Viceroy and there was a local administration there were princely states but the British you know then they uh, <coughs> manipulated the entire resources of the India, Mughal India and they you know palmed out those resources to the United Kingdom, to England and their, their prosperity increased many times. Similarly Britishers were <coughs> the major powers in Canada and in the North America. There was a revolution in the late 18th century of great American revolution in which the local uh, white people who were uh, who fled from the European continent due to the persecution of the church I mean they rebelled against uh, the British king and they established their own freedom declared their own freedom established their own democratic state United States of America initially they were 13 and 14 states and they established a charter of bill of rights they, and a constitution on the basis of which a modern democratic state was established. Similarly, Canada was uh, um, ruled by the French, they were expelled and they, Canada became a sort of part of Canada was ruled by the British, other part of the Canada was ruled by the French, they were expelled and they became a sort of colonies, they enjoyed autonomy under the British crown very early. Uh, contrary to the Indian uh, subcontinent which ultimately got independence after the Second World War in 1947. Australia, Canada and many other countries who were part of the commonwealth of British crown they became autonomous 
and they were having their own parliaments, their own legislatures, they were ruling uh, autonomously, were just affiliated with the crown. So, imperialism, you know, brought different nations, brought different cultures, brought different economies together. I mean, forcefully through conquest, through domination, people came together, they learned each other's languages, they learned each other's cultural taste, they learned each other's uh, way of dressing and behaving and thinking. So, you know, you can say imperialism was a very strong form, very, very provides a very strong theoretical backdrop, a background, a theoretical perspective to study the globalization. The, from the uh, very, I mean, um, uh, womb of imperialism, uh, from the very, I mean, uh, 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 metal, from the very uh, uh, imperialism itself, you know, gave birth to colonialism, which was uh, practically the physical control and domination of the Western powers of Asian and African states. They had a min minority of white Caucasians, you know, they sat in the main uh, capital uh, centers of these states and they ruled them. They changed their educational system, they changed their economic system, they changed their land management system and, you know, they brought their own values, their own practices, their own way of doing business, which the local people are so-called natives, you know, they learned that uh, those practices those uh, values, those uh, rules of behavior and were colonized, they became colonized. The language and the education, you know, it played a very important role. Um, um, look at, for example, the Mughal India. The British, you know, they replaced and substituted the Persian and the Arabic mode of instruction, both in the madrasas and their newly established educational institutions. They replaced that and <coughs> They introduced a reformed and a new British education system, public instruction system in the subcontinent. And there, you know, and the colleges and the modern colleges and the universities where the Western science and the Western technologies were uh, taught, Western arts and sciences were taught and practiced and uh, the uh, medium of instruction both in the educational institutions, universities, colleges and in the administrative offices became English. Now, the change of medium of instruction or mode of communication, I mean, uh, it has left its deep uh, impression and mark on the Indian uh, uh, psyche, on the Indian mindset. Both India and Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka uh, uh, and uh, Burma, etc., etc. Afghanistan was lucky, it became an independent state under the Durrani, uh, uh, Ahmad Shah Durrani, the last Afghan warrior who was able to carve out a sort of a semi-autonomous independent state in the uh, north of India, um, carving out regions from the Mughal Empire, Kaval and Gandhar, some parts of uh, um, territory from Iranian Persian Empire, weakening, weakened Persian Empire and certain parts from the Central Asian states and created his own confederacy, Pakhtun confederacy during the 18th century and ultimately there is uh, sovereignty, sovereignty was fully recognized by the British during 1919 in the Rawalpindi Accord. Despite their two, three attempts to capture Afghanistan and to colonize it, uh, in which they bitterly failed, uh, which, which, which is I mean, known and known in history, the great game, the great game in which they were, you know, trying to contain the uh, Russian Empire, the Tsarist Empire. So they could not reach to the Persian Gulf, to the warm waters, and they were. Um, uh, uh, applying and continuously conspiring against the Russian Empire through Afghanistan, but they failed ultimately and they accepted the Afghanistan as a buffer state between Russia and uh, northwestern India and, and rest of India, the British India. Ultimately, this colonialism also shattered and disintegrated due to two consecutive wars. First World War from 1914 to 1919 between the great powers and the axis and the central powers. And then um, uh, another major war uh, from 1939 to 1945, a major second world which ended uh, with, a, within a, within a, um, 
atomic bang, bomb dropped at uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The war ended, Americans you know dropped two bombs on the imperial Japan, again imperial Japan, one uh, eastern imperial power, imperial Japan, they dropped two. That brought, that brought end to the physical uh, domination of the British in many parts of Asia and Africa. They rolled up their sleeves and they left and I mean leaving things in Mambo Jambo they went back to the to their original uh, place from where they from where they came and almost by the 70s and 80s the colonialism almost saw its uh, final end throughout the world but it brought the cultures it brought the world views it brought the production systems it particularly brought the industrial and technological innovations of west to the east although they were selective i mean the british brought selective industries to india kept certain industries back in their uh, uh, homeland but it did you know globalized it did uh, played a very crucial role very important role in bringing together then we see another from another we can look at globalization from another theoretical perspective and that is industrialism or the industrial revolution. Industrial revolution as you know started with the invention of steam engine in the in the England in the uh, James Watt you know he invented the steam engine then through that uh, steam engine that piston uh, and hydraulic uh, machines you know the industry developed. The factories rose in various parts of England and Germany and France they extracted coal from the mines and the coal became uh, an engine of energy and growth uh, as far as economic and industrial development. Without understanding and knowing the consequences of the pollution and the carbon which they were emitting, they started producing day and night and that we see a flurry of activity in Western Europe, in North America in which we see that the economic power and economic might of the Western powers and the North Americans they had that increased many times that multiplied many times you know it, there was an explosion expo, exponential growth in industrial and technological developments in uh, machine uh, developments of new machines new techniques and i mean from the uh, correspondence physical correspondence letter writing the, the the communication moved during the world second world war telegraph then we see the telephone invention of telephone telegraph and then subsequently the, it led to the eventual growth of internet during the 80s and 90s we see 90s and late 90s 2000 that the whole world is now wired through internet so industrial revolution it exported from europe it went to japan and it went to other parts of asia and africa and india in certain African countries, um, I mean, they became semi-industrialized and they were producing certain things and goods, selling certain goods and things produces to the Europeans, consumers and Europeans were exporting their finished goods and products, advanced finished goods and products to the uh, rest of the world. Japan particularly made leaps, grows in leaps and uh, moved particularly after the second world war during the 50s and 60s they sent their people to um, north america to western europe they learned their technologies their sciences brought it back innovated in their own homeland and you know they springboarded into the world economy by 60s by 70s everywhere it was made in japan it was made in hong kong they were producing clothes they were fine clothes they were producing cars they were producing televisions they were producing telephones, they were producing all sorts of modern gadgets and technology which they learned. But keep in mind that this whole industrial age and the whole industrial era, era was behind the, uh, it was in the background of Bretton Woods, protectionist age in which certain uh, 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 type of trades and goods exchange were allowed and certain was not allowed. It was not a complete uh, free market. Now with the end of Cold War, now there we move to the post-industrial and post-modern society. With the fall of Soviet Union in October 1988, 
the dismember of, of memberment of Berlin Wall, you know, it brought a new social and cultural wave into West European and North American countries and into the rest of the world. It led to the uh, triumph and uh, victory of the liberal democracy uh, throughout the world. And the uh, North, uh, particularly the United States, became the champion of liberal democracy. And it uh, was sort of uh, uh, in a very emphatic way uh, propagated and imposed its agenda, political agenda, human rights agenda, economic agenda, uh, philosophical, I would say, ideological agenda throughout the world. And the carrier and the mode of uh, spreading and uh, uh, exporting that agenda and that program uh, was internet, was the new, uh, the new technologies, the mobile technologies, the wireless technologies, the internet technologies, they, you know, created an environment in which the Americans were successful in exporting their ideas, political ideas, in exporting their uh, economic um, practices and in exposing their technological and industrial achievements and developments. So, you can say the uh, end of Cold War, uh, you know, where the, the Soviet Union was totally collapsed, the free market economy became the yardstick and the hallmark of the global uh, political economy. Now, if you want to survive in this uh, tough jungle of global political economy, you have to compete. Here comes the WTO, which emphasizes free trade between the nations, theoretically, but practically those who have more advanced technologies, more advanced industries, those who, are, those who have more clout and power in the global political affairs and the global political governance, they have more access, they have unequal access to trading opportunities. They have unequal access to economic opportunities. They have unequal access to business opportunities. While those nations and countries who are, you know, sort of backward in uh, technological uh, and uh, information and communication innovations, they are dependent on these, I mean, core countries. In the words of Emmanuel Wallerstein, they are the core states, the West European and the North American. They make the core of the world system. And the rest of the world the, are, you know, like the peripheries. They go around them. They survive and they are dependent on these states. Now, I, through IMF and World Bank, Asian Development, other financial institutions, this, you know, post-industrial and post-modern society is now moving along very rapidly, very forcefully, very strongly, very dynamically. It is changing and transfer, transforming the local economies, the native economies. One sector which has very badly been affected due to globalization is this, that is, that is the agriculture sector. In Pakistan, in India, in Bangladesh, in other Far Eastern countries, in, your, in, uh, in African countries, the agriculture has came, came into grave stress because the countries which were countries like North America, countries which produce surplus food, you know, they are selling their food to these markets, exporting their food to these markets. India has been able to get some protections from WTO in ag agriculture, but uh, we have no protection. So, in the post-industrial society, we find an <coughs> increasing and complex movement of free markets through a sort of information and electronic capital. The capital, I, I call it neurocapitalism. It is the next month, the Lenin referred to imperialism as the next stage of capitalism. I, uh, I mean, uh, would like to describe uh, present day global economy as a neurocapitalist economy which is by neurocapitalist economy, I mean to say that an economy which is rooted in continuous perpetual production of information and knowledge by the consumption of human neurons. The more you can use your neurons, the more advantage you have in the world economic system. So, I mean you can say the North Americans, they are leading the Japanese and Chinese in the footstep of the Americans. They are imitating rapidly, innovating, and 
are capturing the major size of the world free markets. So, th in this neuro capitalism, where free markets are everywhere, where we are part of the interconnected, highly wired free market economy, uh, uh, you have to continuously innovate and invent. And you can, your economy, your national economy can be disrupted from anywhere. You can be surprised or you can surprise the other economy by innovating and inventing. So, that is the hallmark of the, you do not know where you are going. That is the hallmark of the services and the post industrial society. The, uh, uh, the objectivity, the rationality, the order and the regularity which was emphasized and which was much valued during the industrial society has disappeared. And new modes and new modes of social and cultural and political and economic behavior have started to galvanize and appear on the world map and there is no escaping. So, I mean the, these are you can say three, four important theories with which you can uh, uh, study globalization. Uh, finally, I would like to end uh, globalization, my lecture on theories of globalization on a rather lighter note. I mean, I think uh, um, um, now you have to look at globalization from a very critical angle. I mean, do you think that it, it can survive? Particularly in the recent context and the recent backdrop, backdrop of the breakthrough of global pandemic of coronavirus, which appeared in China ha and has taken over the entire world. And now the production and innovation has practically stopped. The plants throughout the world, the production throughout the world has come to a standstill. And it has reversed the process of globalization. Now they are saying do not shake hand with anyone, stay within your home, do not do this, do not do that. Two months ago they were saying come on welcome other people, open for tourism, open for uh, hoteling, open for uh, I mean uh, <coughs> uh, 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 sort of uh, entertainment, open up. Everything was for sale, even human emotions as C. Wright Mills, human personalities, everything you know decorated, painted, globalization brought us to this level where the human flesh was also becoming available for sale in one form, in one garb, one mask, another mask, in the mask of entertainment, in the mask of music, in the mask of enjoyment, in the mask of player, tourism. So, I think uh, a point, a saturation point has come to globalization itself and thinkers and uh, philosophers the spiritualists throughout the world are reflecting whether this is the end of the world which was created in the post war era and the world is moving towards a new direction, emergence of a new system, emergence of a new world that has to be seen. Thank you very much.